It's it's four o'clock. I know we like to wait for people, but I also know that other people have other appointments. So welcome to our second session on unplugged coding. I had very good feedback last week. Please let me know how it goes if you have suggestions. Some people said I was too fast on the activities last week. I know when you're online, you tend to think 10 seconds is a minute. So please tell me if you think I'm too fast again today. Uh, I'll do my best. We, we're looking at uh, computational thinking today. And we've got two guests already tuned in. Meliska Nortier from Excelsior Primary School. She sent me some nice photos and I thought she must just give us some feedback. And then uh, may I say the legendary Keith Gibson, who's going to give us, we're going to play Oprah Winfrey today. He's going to talk about a new compendium of activities he's put together. And then we're going to distribute it to all of you. So we've got this Oprah Winfrey thing going with us today. Okay, so I'm going to start um, trying to remember how to share my screen. Right, so we're doing Coding Unplugged. Uh, again, I want to give credit to all the other people that have contributed to these presentations. Uh, Keith Gibson that will be joining us later on. Kelly Bush that helped with the lesson plans that I used last week and I'll be using two weeks from now. Selby Makuna that, that played a big part in our February workshops. And then I'm using, I'm using some uh, material from Leander Oosthuizen as well today. She's the IT teacher at uh, Alexander Road High here in Port Elizabeth. Okay, so when we think computational thinking, I want to literally read through this. This is from Leander's presentation, which kind of says what I'm trying to emphasize today. Introducing coding in the curriculum is not about coding. And I feel very strongly about that. Uh, even more for primary school, but just as true for secondary school. It is rather about a culture of algorithmic thinking, breaking down more complex actions into a sequence of instructions and computational thinking, focusing on problems and the solutions. So th the focus of today is not coding. Uh, I think I said that as well last week, um, that we at universities that receive learners from school the thing we miss the most, the thing that we would want to be much more improved is learners' ability to solve problems, uh, especially in the computer science uh, faculty, but in any other faculty, I believe. It's relevant. If learners cannot solve problems, then they, they're going to struggle uh, at a univer any university qualification, as well as in their own school subjects. So the focus today is on the solving of problems. I heard Keith say this for the first time, that I heard it. I don't know whether it's your original saying, Keith, or whether you got it from someone else. You cannot translate from English to French if you cannot speak English. What we're trying to say about this in, in the current context is that you cannot, doesn't help to learn learners how to code, to teach them how to code, if they cannot solve problems. Coding is not a skill in itself. Coding is simply just a tool that you use once you know how to solve the problem. So our, our emphasis again, as I said, problem solving, and I cannot say it enough, uh, coding and robotics at primary school should be 80% problem solving, probably even no coding, but the problem solving is the important part. These are the five skills also from Leander's presentation that have been identified as important for the fourth industrial revolution or the 21st century. Critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, communication, and then computational thinking. Now in all the unplugged activities that we're trying to introduce here, and I'm, I'm not saying we've invented the wheel. There's a lot of people talking about coding. All the unplugged activities, address all five of these issues. If you do them correctly, if you do them in groups, if, if it stays fun, all of these uh, five skills kick in. When we do doing the tanks workshop in two weeks time, you will see if you do it with kids and learners, but even the activities we did last week, I had a bunch of teachers in Kariha on Friday afternoon, and they were doing foundation phase activities. And all of five of these skills was present, were present. 
Okay, I got these lovely photos from uh, Meliska at Excelsior, and when I saw them, I said to her, no, she must just give us some input today. So Meliska, I'm going to hand over to you just for five minutes, just to tell us what you do at Excelsior, and then just to explain these two photos uh, for the delegates. Thanks. Over to you, Meliska. Thanks, John. So what I was thinking is our learners never even saw a computer. So for me to start coding with them, telling them all about the computer stuff is definitely not going to work. So what I started off with the first week um, is introducing them to the importance of instructions. So I actually, I actually did a little exercise with them where I took two slices of bread for each group. They were working in groups of five. And they had to write instructions for me how to make a Marmite and butter sandwich for them. So then I took the instructions literally and I did exactly what they said to me. For example, the one group said, after you spread the butter, you must put the two slices together. So I put the one face down and the other was on the side, on top of the face side. So it basically looks like an owl shape. Um, and then they started to realize how precisely they have to write the instructions down. And even now, four weeks later, they still, every, every time I give them a little exercise and I walk through and I listen to what they're saying, they're saying, guys, remember, we must be precise with the instructions. So that was very uh, nice for me. Also, every lesson that we're doing, I am teaching them a new concept related to coding. And then also we're doing a group activity where they have to do problem solving um, the first week we did the instructions then the second week we did sequencing where they had to play the game of Simon Says for example um, where I gave them a list of instructions that they must follow and then they must create the sequence with that for example touch your eyes uh, tickle your tummy touch your head turn around things like that and then each time that they forget then they fall out and a new sequence comes in. Um, we also did the team challenge last week that we did was where I, uh, the game's called Save Fred, where they each got a gummy worm and they got one of those round sweeties. They got a little a plastic bowl and four paper clips. So the round sweet was on the table, placed on the table, then the plastic cup was on top of that, and the gummy worm were on top of the little container. And it was actually a story about the gummy worm that went to swim and was rough seas and the boat uh, flipped over and the gummy worm is now stuck on top of the boat. So they now have to use those four paper clips in order to get the gummy worm into the boat safely in his little life jacket, that's the round sweet. So it was quite interesting to see how the learners try to maneuver those little paper clips, bending them out and putting it back in and um, working together in a group, realizing soon enough it won't, it's not helping just doing it one by one. Um, we, and then this week that has passed, we did looping. So the learners, um, first thing, the team challenge where they got 10 uh, pieces of spaghetti and they got five marshmallows each and they had to build the strong, the highest tower they possibly can using a 10 centimeter uh, roll of duct tape, piece of duct tape. So some of them try to use the duct tape to actually stick the spaghetti to the table. Other learners, um, put the marshmallows as pillars on the ground and then build up the, um, the spaghetti towers like that. So it was really in every group that we worked with was different. So it's amazing to see how they think um, of the ways how to do this. Uh, I work with around 40 children from grade R to grade seven. So yeah, it's quite interesting that. And then the looping, the other picture that you will see there, the one with the circles, each team consists out of five members and they got two A4 size papers where I just told them they need to make the longest chain for me using this paper. So they cut it into small pieces, glued it together and they made this long chain. It was quite interesting. Some of the learners thought of making big long ones. So they cut the papers diagonally. Others turned the paper and made it small little vertical oh, um, horizontal lines. So yeah, it was very, very interesting. 
the learners, we will now introduce the tanks game to them this week coming, tomorrow and on Thursday. But yeah, like I said, each team, each week, we try and take the things that we have to uh, available to us because we are a very poor school of not a lot of resources. And we're trying to get the learners to think of problem solving skills and work together in a group. So yes, thank Melissa, you, John. Thanks, thanks, excellent. I was very encouraged when I saw this. And notice it's a low resource school, so everything they use here is cheap, which is brilliant. A uh, quick last question, the ideas for these games, did you think them up yourself or did you find resources on the internet that you used? I went looking on Pinterest and then I came across this thing where it says um, all the different, what you, the elements of coding, okay. all the different terminology and stuff like that. So now each week I try and incorporate one of those terminology and the, the games that I come up with like that building a tower is just brain teasers that I went to look for. Brilliant. So, but then I didn't, yeah, so I just used some of those ideas and I incorporated with the things that we actually had. Excellent. Okay. Thanks, Melissa. I wish we had more time, but thanks for sharing this. I really think this Thank is... Thank you, John. Thanks, Abe. Thank you. Okay. Right. Thanks, Melissa. So let's, we had our first activity. This is a well-known computational thinking activity. It's actually in the grade nine curriculum. Uh, I first saw it from Keith. And I believe it's probably somewhere in, in the prime, new primary school curricula as well. And I want you guys to try and play with this quickly. So the basic idea here is you've got A and B. You want to swap them around. A must be with B and B must be where A is. And you've got a crane that can go down, up. It can grab, it can release, it can move left, and it can move right. So you want to swap A and B. And you've got one of these five options. That is the correct option. So I'm going to try and not rush you. Let's give you a minute or two to go through these options. And if someone is ready, just tell me. Not immediately. Let's give you time first. See whether you can find the correct option. Those who've done it before just don't correspond now. Just be quiet for a while. Okay, over to you. Find the correct option. So you go down, grab, go up. Right, go down. Release, A is in the middle, go up, go right, go down, grab, apologies for my dog, go up, go left, go left, go down, release B where A was, go up, go right, go down, grab A, go up, go right, go down and release A. So B is your correct option. Um, and this is, this is virtual coding and robotics. On paper, uh, I see uh, Mario confirmed that it is in the grade nine curricula. So it's a well-known activity. I'll talk to you later where you can find many more of these. Okay. Now some I'll draw on my screen. I don't know, that's interesting. I've never seen that before. Okay, right. So when we're talking computational thinking, they say there's four concepts that play a role uh, you start normally with decomposition at the top. So it's simplifying a problem, breaking it down into smaller parts. Then you go to pattern recognition on the right hand side, finding similarities amongst the problems at hand. Then you go to abstraction, looking at the problem and deciding what is irrelevant, what is relevant, what do I focus on to solve the problem. And then the last one is the algorithm, the recipe to solve the problem, the plan. Now, before we carry on, if you, if you look at these four words, these are all four very important, just simply life skills, whether you're doing coding or maths or whether you just living. Decomposition, pattern recognition, abstraction and algorithm. Emphasizing the concept that coding is much more than coding. Okay, now I'm going to give you a little activity. I've given four activities. Now, for those who know Nuit for a Nuit, this is kind of a Nuit for a Nuit game. So on the left-hand side, you've got the plan to build a Lego little car. Top right, you've got a, a challenge which says a beaver wants to buy a birdhouse for her daughter's birthday. 
The daughter says, I would like a birdhouse with two windows and a heart. The bottom one left shows how you would plan a vacation. And the bottom right says to you how to draw a, rect a, a square. Now, I don't want us to solve these problems. I, I'm going to give you a few minutes to take these words, decomposition, abstraction, pattern recognition, and algorithm, and map each one of them with each one of these. So each one of these on the left is an example of the four concepts. See whether you can do it. I'll give you a minute or two. Talk to me if you're unsure about what I'm asking. Again, this time I'm gonna ask for a volunteer to give me your answer. What, what's the mapping that you got for the four concepts? I hope it's quite obvious, but it kind of just emphasizes the concepts. Okay, who was that asking? Who wanted to give his answer? Oh, it's me, uh, John Victor. Okay, Victor, go for it. Um, so I would, the suggestion from this side is the little houses is the pattern recognition. Okay. And then the playing the vacation is the decomposition. Okay. And then the um, Lego block is the um, the algorithm, and then abstraction is the square. Okay. So if I was playing on radio, I would say two out of four, but obviously there's no, no correct answer. Is there anyone else that has a different solution? Victor, you can, I'll give you now a chance to motivate your answer, but I had a different answer. Um, anyone that um, want to map the, the concepts differently? It is Annie van Amarwe here. Yes, Annie. Um, I've got the same pattern as the little houses. The plan vacation is to decompose decomposition the algorithm is the square with all the dots and the abstraction is the lego okay that's interesting so clearly i'm not i'm not the be all and end all because i've got a totally different uh, hi can you hear me yes go for it. your suggestion it's a seal from east side yes. um the decompo decomposition is the legos the okay. pattern recognition are the houses yeah. The abstraction is the vacation plan and the algorithm is the blocks, the, okay. the square at the bottom. Sure. Okay, so you all have different answers and I'm not going to try and decide who's correct. Can I go through my logic? And, and then I'm not saying I'm correct, but okay, I must say this is Lihanda's logic. I said I'm using some of her presentation. So Keith, you can go and tell Lihanda we don't agree with her. Um, so the first one, decomposition, I think the planning the vacation is to me very obviously decomposition. Decomposition means taking a problem and breaking it up into smaller problems. So planning a vacation has four different steps, okay? Now abstraction, and, and I kind of agree, but we could debate it if we had time. Abstraction is the houses because the problem says, I would like a birdhouse with two windows and a heart. So when you look at these houses, you decide what, what information on these houses are relevant and what informations are irrelevant. So uh, abstraction means deciding what's, what's important to solve the problem, what's not important to solve the problem. So the original solution with that was the houses. Pattern recognition, uh, because probably I've done this often, that's why this one is pattern recognition for me. Pattern re recognition, we're going to do it in two weeks time with thanks as to do with things that are repeated, the same steps that are repeated patterns in maths or loops in coding. So the squares draw a straight line and turn 90 degrees. That's repeated four times. So that's a pattern that we see. And then the algorithm is the recipe to solve the solution, solve the problem. So typically when you're playing with Lego blocks, you would get this little picture on your pamphlet and you would use this algorithm to go and build your little Lego rubble. But I'm not going to say the other answers are wrong. I was just trying to enforce, emphasize the different concepts. Unfortunately, we don't have time to debate this, so let's go on. Okay, exercise three. 
Uh, this is from tanks, but we're not really doing tanks now. Just, it's just another computational thinking exercise. 3A is the easy one. You've got these five commands. You always start with start, and you want to move the tank to the star. So quickly see what order you would put them, uh, these five commands, and what order would you, um, oops. And what order would you put these five command blocks horizontally to get your tank to go to the, to the star? And while you're busy, I see Keith says we could have discussed the previous one. I wish we had time, Keith. Uh, maybe at the end, if we have a few minutes, we could go back to that activity. Okay, anyone that wants to give me the order of sequence to get your tank to a star? Someone that hasn't given an answer yet. Just speak up. Okay, I'll go for it. It's Rebecca. Okay. Yes. Uh, I would... Uh, am I correct that I, I can't use those cards twice? I can only use each card once. Yes, only once, yeah. Okay, then I would go backwards, uh, backwards, uh -huh. turn, left, turn left, move forward, move forward twice. Yes, so you go backwards, your tank reverses, it turn lefts, le turns left, it points towards the star, move forward, move forward. Okay, so that's just coding. I won't say that's computational thinking, but the next one has a little trick in it. Uh, now I'm going to give you slightly more time. You want to move your tank to the star, and you're only allowed to use the commands that I give you there. People that have played tanks before just don't give me the answer because that's one of the tricks we teach the kids right at the start. But this is computational thinking. This is thinking slightly out of the box. May I ask, do you have to use all the cards that are there or just some of them? If you can do it with only some of them, I would be surprised. You're welcome, but you can't add cards and you can't copy cards. You've got to use the only ones that I gave you. And obviously there's a wall, you can't go through the wall. Hi, John. Uh, can we share our screen? Yeah, okay, let me, uh, yeah, last week when I stopped sharing, I lost image and it was just a black screen. So I'm a bit scared. Maybe you can just read your solution to us, can you? So last week something went wrong with the recording when I stopped sharing. Okay, uh, our solution is uh, it will start, yeah. then it will move forward. Yes. Right, yes. move forward, move forward, Yeah. then left. Move backwards. Yes, that last one. That's per who's talking? It is Gerard from Lechbron here. Okay, great. So yeah, that step is the is the trick step which kids don't see. Uh, you move forward, then you turn right. So you move forward, move forward until you're next to the star. Now, intuitively, you would want to turn right and move forward onto the star, but you only have three move forwards. So then you have to turn left and move backwards onto the star. So that turn left, move backwards is, is a little problem that, that kids don't, they struggle to see this. We recorded in tanks the moves and, and one team took like 17 attempts until they could get this right or they steal a move forward from another group. Uh, but that's not the idea, the way to solve it. Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk about this and then I'm going to go back to that previous example and then we're going to break and come back for Keith because I don't want him to be interrupted. The online activities that I've been talking about and the computational thinking activities, there are literally hundreds of them, thousands available on the internet. And these are some of the websites where you can go to code.org, CS Unplugged, oops, code.org, CS Unplugged and the Institute of IT Professionals South Africa Talent Search. It's like an annual computer Olympiad for people that don't have computers. You solve uh, uh, computational problems so you can do it pen and paper. You can submit pen and paper. So this Talent Search one is the local one and all the old papers are there. 
So you could prepare your school now to participate next year. I think it's around March every year. But co.org and CS Unplugged are all free sites where you can get thousands of activities. Let's quickly say what the chats. Okay, people are just commenting there. Right, so these three activities are, are really ones that, that uh, are websites that I can really recommend. Okay, on Keith's, Keith's suggestion, let's go back to this one. Um, Keith, I'm gonna hand over to you until our 10 minutes is up and then we'll come back for your session. So not your official talk. Why did, why did you say it is brave to break them up like this? If you're there, Keith, and then we can, the other guys that gave other solutions can also motivate their answers. We've got a few minutes. Keith? Uh, okay, thanks, Sean. Uh, now, I was actually saying I, was, I, I wasn't brave enough to go to Lundy and tell her that she was wrong, but... Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 yeah. Having said that, you know, admittedly, my mind jumped to to certain things like pattern recognition for the um, for the for the birdhouses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I think the reality is in, in in a lot of these a lot of these there are there is perhaps more than one elephant elephant in the room in terms of to say okay, well maybe it's a bit of this and it's a bit of that in some yes. cases. Um, I think one or two stand out maybe, but I think one or two could probably be, and I think everybody who gave solutions would probably come up with fairly good um, motivations, you know, so uh, particularly maybe two of them would stick um, uh, to me when I, the bottom two could both be an algorithm of some sort, but it's when you're having to choose the one over the other. Yes. So I think in some cases it might be a little bit of, of okay, this is an example of abstraction and pattern recognition uh, all built in one. Uh, I've certainly found that in the examples that I've put together is that sometimes you have different forces, even in the very simple example, you have different factors coming into play at the same time, even just yes. as your own thinking, I think. That's very true. When Kelly Bush did her lesson plans for boats, she, she emphasized <coughs> uncertainty is not is not a problem when you code. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. So the, the other people that made suggestions, uh, motivate your answers for us. Just let's kind of prove the point that Keith has said. I think Victor was one. I can't remember who else had solutions that differed from mine. So I'm challenging the people that differed from me to motivate your answers. Um, it's Honey speaking here. Yes, Honey. I said um, recognition for the bird houses because it is all about shapes there. Okay. Um, that that you have to recognize. Um, okay, we agreed on the decomposition. The algorithm I said it is the square with the um, instructions because it is clear instructions what to do. That is sort yes. of an algorithm yes. for me. Very and true. then. Yes, the abstraction for me was I have to have this idea in my brain and I put it together to get that whatever I built into the Lego. Okay. So and that is one? sort of yeah, taking what is abstract in my head and visualize it and put it on in Lego form. Yeah, definitely. The, the one that's the strongest motivation is algorithm. The bottom right one is clearly also an algorithm. There's no doubts about that. Uh, Hi, it's Cecilia. Yes. Um, I would like to say that the, the one of the planned vacation, Yeah. we thought it was abstraction because you would book your tickets and reserve your hotel, but you would not necessarily pack your suitcase while planning a vacation. That would be when you go on the vacation. Itself. Ah, brilliant, brilliant. Okay, good. I like the logic. So I think, as I said, that's why I wanted to go back to this um, it's good, but what we're doing by differing is we're showing that we're understanding the concepts. And I think that's important. Um, and just imagine the problem solving skills kids are picking up when they're doing all of these things. Because these are life skills. These are not just coding skills. Uh, we've got one minute. Victor, didn't you also have a suggestion? Yes, yes um, John. Um, I, my idea for the um, algorithm for the Lego was that there's only a certain um, certain order that you can build those blocks to get to that shape or that design. 
you can't just go free for all and just start building blocks. You have to follow a sequence and you have to follow a certain order to get to this shape. Mm. So that was my idea for algorithm for the Lego blocks. So as I said at the start, um, we're playing Oprah Winfrey today. I challenged Keith about a month ago to come up with a compendium of, of computational activities. Keith, I want you to talk about this compendium. I've just shown one question from these activities. We're not going to do this. And just give us your general... I know in the previous workshop, you spoke about what you did at Collegiate last year and probably doing again wow. this year. So I'm going to hand over to you, and then we can also just ask you questions. Over to you, yeah. Keith. Well, thanks, John, and thanks to everybody. This is really very, very, very exciting. Um, I say John has spoken. The background was that uh, our... our I've been teaching IT for many years and I've moved across to Collegiate Girls High um, and we introduced IT and we were, and I also picked up all the grade eight and nine classes and of course there's no definitive syllabus because we're not doing digital technology. So my media thought was go to what you know, start teaching them coding. Um, and then if COVID ever have a silver lining, it was probably this, is that it disrupted the year and I had to think very quickly because teaching coding online is not that easy. And I thought, well, what are they actually, they're not all going to become coders, and I think that's the important part, but they all need to be able to solve problems. And then I suddenly thought, I need to take, I had to reflect myself, and I need to say, right, I need to take this a step back. And so we got to a stage where, and it, it, it was quite a mind opener for the children, because I was saying to them, fine, we're not using the computers, and we've got two labs, you know, when they came back, and I said, you can use the computers to download the worksheet, but that's it. Um, we're solving this with pen and paper and thinking. And the thing that I say to them every single day is, is that you problem solve from the time that you're born, from the time that you wake up in the morning, you're problem solving. Just some of us are better at it than others. And we take a simple thing, and I've heard a few good examples again this afternoon, the one that I often use is to make a cup of coffee. And of course, they get extremely competitive because one says you must fetch the mug first and one says you must switch the kettle on. And then we debate about does it matter which order they're in? Well, some of them do, some of them don't. Why should we switch the kettle on first? So it's so it's playing to these everyday examples. I tell them choosing what outfit you're going to use, you're going to go to your matric out farewell in one day is a, is a problem solving exercise. Choosing your career is a problem solving exercise. Relationships are all problem solving exercises. So I try and get some buy in with that because I, I don't want this to be a, a cold mathematical. Um, although there's a lot of it that's derived from mathematics. I say to them, the, the stuff you do in your maths class is all abstract. We're doing the practical, real, fun stuff here. And so that's what we've done. We've introduced these activities, and they're largely based on the, the, the computer Olympiad talent search type of things. And then Jean approached me. So I haven't had a lot of sleep the last three weeks. Thanks, Shot. No, but I've absolutely loved it. I mean, this is, I'm really involved in this for 35 years, and I've never been more excited about what we're doing now because we're doing something positive for every single child in this country. Uh, and this Coding Unplugged, um, I'll, I'll take it one step further, is the only way to go. Um, and what we're doing is the only way to go. Um, because coding is a minor, minor step in the end. Um, and if you speak to people who've done programming, it's the analysis and the thought and everything that goes into before it. And so I would probably be very tempted, like Jean, to take coding certainly out of most of the, the primary school curriculum, um, because that's just, as Jean used example, it's like translating from English into French. And if you can't speak English, well, then you've got a problem. And we know there are problems in the primary schools. There's problems in the high schools um, with uh, pupils not being able to read accurately, to analyze things, to read with uh, analysis, to understand those things. And so this is something that is across the curriculum, absolutely across the curriculum. And that's why I am, I've never been excited about the five years of teaching than I am right now. Um, and I, and I, John's going to have to stop me on that because I'll carry on forever. And we, we can talk about all the theoretical, the five C's and all of that type of thing. I keep that all away from my pupils, to be honest. I said, and, and I choose the, and I try to manufacture problems that will demonstrate those type of things. And then afterwards, they can say, okay, but maybe we could have done this a bit better if we look, you see those steps have been repeated. Maybe we could have done that a bit better. Uh, and so the emphasis is on, and, and I'm 100% I'm convinced that, that pupils have been turned off these subjects because they're just not fun anymore. And I'm not saying it must be fun every minute of the day, 
but children learn as we do as adults like we are this afternoon while having fun that's the best form of learning when you actually don't even know that you're learning sometimes as you go along um and so i've put this compendium together there are, there are primarily at the moment there are 40 exercises um that i've put together some of them with sub exercises what i don't know is when things are suitable for certain grades or whatever now i just want to make a comment on that you will find even within your own classes, be careful of allocating certain problems to certain grades because you, I, I teach 10 junior classes and every single one of them is different. Uh, and there are different levels of ability within those same classes as well. So some of the classes, I can, there are some pupils who can do more advanced concepts. So don't pigeonhole the problems. I think you, you, the teacher in the end knows their class. Um, and that nobody can replace that. So I, I was initially going to say, okay, yeah, the grade one problems, yeah, the grade two problems, but I, I'm going to leave it for the teachers to do um, because it depends entirely on who's in front of them and what the background is, et cetera, et cetera. And I say that that, that happens at my school, which is an astonishingly privileged school. There are big gaps and big differences between the abilities of some of the children. And I know this is working because when I choose IT now in grade 10, I can see the pupils that are choosing IT have developed a love for the subject before they have started the subject and they're showing the ability to do problem solving and that's kind of the, sort of the, the in, a, in a nutshell um, where we are at the moment and so I produce these problems on a variety of levels and I'm also trying to work backwards as well I'm fortunate that I come from an IT background so I'm saying well what are the skills and I'm giving it to my IT children as well these classes exercises even exercises like this um, Rebecca suggested grouping. Yes, it can. It can do. And, and again, you, you will find certainly, and I find that some children want to work on their own and I let them do that. At other times, they need to be able to, to join in and sometimes depending on the type of problem that's involved. But certainly when they, when they come up with different solutions, which I also encourage, then it's a good idea to sit them down and say, okay, like we did earlier amongst ourselves, um, we say, okay, well, this solution uh, is better than that solution. Why, or it's an alternative. Why did we disagree? That type of thing. So all of these come out in these fairly simple, um, uh, the exercises that they have, a lot of them, I give them multiple choice sets for some of them to say, okay, choose between these two. Um, but I think the trick is, uh, the question that's coming up there is to say, well, just, you can you can tackle it the way that you want to so adapt these problems if you want a group discussion in class about it or you want your pupils to work on it but i think the verbalization i think we, we're touching on a whole lot of skills we're touching on communication skills um the ability for children to analyze and read accurately so i think you've got to adapt it to local circumstances and that's why i'm always very scared with curricula and i've worked with curricula a lot uh, when they try and pigeonhole every pupil into the same classroom, into the same ability group, as if they, everyone is in the same. So I teach 10 classes and every one of them has got a different nature by itself. Uh, I think I'll stop there because I know I'm going to go on forever. Uh, I'm, I'm so excited by this project. It's, 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 it's absolutely amazing. It's mind-blowing, the opportunities that we've got here. Thanks, thanks, Keith. And uh, so we're going to be sending out this compendium of activities to all everyone part of this uh, workshop. So kids, we want the, the feedback we want is kind of a guideline. You don't need to do it for all 40, but any of those, if you can give us feedback, kind of what range of grades you think it's relevant to, because we, we're not sure. We, kids is yeah. to high school and I'm a professor. So that, am I correct in saying we would like feedback from teachers that use them to say grade one to three or grade four to five or grade one to seven or whatever. John, yes, as 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 a as a precursor to that, but, but it does say with with the rider that that different schools might find it differently, and you're, yes, you're yeah. going to find there's going to be a pupil in your class that I mean, you know, the same happens at my school. It's it's all just relevant in terms of where we're looking at that some pupils can advance, and so it's to have all of that ready. Um, and okay. and I think that's the big thing. Teachers don't always we don't have time, and one of the reasons why I'm managing to do this now is because I'm teaching on a part time basis because. I'm not doing all the thousand administrative tasks that I know you all involved with that. And so it's time that we can get the chance to experiment with activities. And if we say that's a terrible activity, I really would like to hear that. If it's a great activity, we need more of that. The children don't. And I've deliberately tried to keep the, the, the context South African where possible and also the wording as simple as possible. Um, okay. 
and because I think that's important as well. Excellent, Keith. Thank you very much. As I said, I'll email this directly after this workshop. Uh, and then we would really appreciate feedback, say, by next semester, uh, because this is a, a work in progress. I think Keith, Keith is not... Oh, absolutely. A, it's done. Absolutely. That's not no, how I understand absolutely. Keith's life principle. So any feedback would be great. And we, the, the ultimate aim is to make these activities available to schools at no cost. Uh, we're not going to make money out of them. Um, no, totally. Mm. Yeah, so that's the idea. So, but you guys are our first guinea pigs in experimenting with it. Okay, thank you very much, Keith. Thanks for the great work you've done over the decades. Thank you. It's an absolute pleasure to be involved with this type of activity and, and with the people involved in this forum and throughout the country as well. We can do it together. I'm convinced of it. Thanks, Keith. Okay, so just quickly on next week, uh, if any of you have not received your packs for next week, please email me. I, I'm hoping they've all arrived. Sometimes something does go wrong. So just email if you haven't received your packs, those who are expecting packs. Next week, we'll be focusing on the Boats app. There's a lot of things you can do in the Boats app without buying anything. A lot of the features in the Boats app is for free and it's also coding. But I would want to ask you to please make sure you've got the app downloaded on your phones before the workshop. Otherwise, you're going to sit and listen to other people playing. So it's boats powered by Tangible. And it's unfortunately only on Android. We didn't do it for the iPhone. Uh, and then in your packs, you'll find little direction cards with QR codes on. Those are the cards that you'll be using for next week. Um, I can also email them to you if you haven't received them. But they should have arrived with your tanks game in two weeks time. Okay, so before I stop, is there any last questions? I don't see anything. Okay, I trust you've enjoyed uh, today. Comment? Uh, Jean, so, Jean, sorry, just one thing. I, I'm not sure if people have my email. They're more than welcome to contact me via email. You have it, so you might yes, want I'll, to. Yes, I'll CC you in the email that I send out to everyone. Right stuff. Okay, pleasure. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thanks for being part of this, and and you all, we're all part of history, yeah. Uh, so yeah, there's a question from Vanessa that says, "Will the tanks pieces work on boats as well?" No, the boats has the separate cards. Vanessa, I, I'll email you. I know you you've got tanks. I'll just email you the boats cards that you can just print out. Uh, it's it's a waste of courier to courier any of them to you. So if anyone else is unsure, email me. Thanks for your time this afternoon.